Morning, everyone. If you're just coming in, uh, settle down quickly, please. We'll get going in a, a minute. Okay. Morning, everyone. Hope you had a good weekend. <clears throat> so, we are carrying off from where we left last week. Um, thanks for all of those that went to the uh, tutorial late on Friday. Um, appreciate it. it's not a great time, but um, I understand the turnout was pretty good, so well done. Um, they will continue to be in person uh, in this building every, um, every second Friday. Um, the second tutorial sheet is already out. I'll, sh I'll well, you can see it here, look. And the first tutorial sheet solutions are out. Um, if anybody missed it or want some more, um, wants a closer look at the, at the answers. The second tutorial is out now, like I said. A couple of, a couple of uh, things are going to um, be introduced in there that we're going to cover for the first time. Okay, I think I'm having some trouble with internet. Okay, so the, the tutorial has um, pressure is basically hydrostatic, so it has variation of uh, pressure in manometers. It has the uh, calculation of force um, acting on inclined sur on surfaces in a fluid. And you'll note that next week is also when the coursework is going to be issued. So in this in this module, so it's 80% exam, there's, there's two 5% which are um, relatively easy to get. You get 5% for doing your lab, there's no lab report, you just turn up and engage, and 5% for doing the quizzes, quiz questions by the end of the semester. But 10% you have to work quite a bit harder for, and that's the tutorial question that's going to be issued next week. So that is designed to give you a little bit of experience with how the the format of the exam is going to be, the written exam in January. But of particular relevance, the, the questions that you're going to be asked in the, um, in the coursework are going to be quite similar to the types of questions that you're going to be asked in Tutorial Sheet 2. Okay, so the timing is on purpose. The Tutorial Sheet is, is issued this week, next Friday's tutorial. So whatever that is, um, so will be the, um, so that's the end of next week. We'll, the the uh, GTAs will go through all of those um, questions from tutorial sheet two, and hopefully that will help support some of the, some of the queries or questions that you have uh, going through uh, the coursework as well. You'll remember that we have five weeks of teaching in part one, followed by, if you like, a light week, so where there isn't any new taught content before teaching um, of part two starts. And that again is on purpose because that coincides with the, the last week of your coursework. So you'll be issued the coursework at the end of mid, mid, mid of next week and you'll have until, you'll have two weeks to do that basically. Okay. Um, 
other stuff to point out. You might have noticed that the, the, the recommended reading is always slightly ahead of where we are with the content, and that's on purpose, so that if you can, um, if you do get a chance to do the recommended reading, you're looking at some of the, the content before we go through it in lectures. Um, so this week, the uh, recommended reading and the, and the uh, condensed notes are related to forces on a plane, and, and they go also into rigid body motion that we probably won't cover until next week in lectures, but it's good to see it in advance if you can. There's um, an asynchronous video, because in Thursday's lecture, we're going to be doing forces on a submerged plane, and in order to do that, we need to be able to calculate the second moment of area. And I think that the second moment of area is a new concept uh, to you. So it's, it's a relatively um, commonly used um, concept in engineering to calculate how the moment of different distribution of mass affects an object and the forces that act on that object. And it's introduced uh, in this asynchronous video here. So I recommend that you have a look at that before Thursday. I think it's only about 10 minutes. Okay, and so here are the slides from today. A reminder then, tomorrow we have another online um, surgery. Um, there was around, I don't know, 10, 20 people that turned up last week and asked questions. Um, so we'll do that again tomorrow at 11. Okay. Any questions on any of that stuff? Yep. We're going to talk about that straight away, so you won't have to wait long. So I'm having some trouble with um, Piazza, but it doesn't matter because I've got the, um, the content here. So we've been through what we're going to do this week, and we'll kick off with this. So this question is on Piazza. There's a few attempts that I've seen already before I started the lecture, but um, for some reason I can't show you that live. The two questions. Question one. There is a diagram showing two liquids. Uh, we're told that it's at rest, and we're told that there is only one possible variation of the pressure through this uh, tank from the top directly down to the bottom. Um, and that's it. You've got you've to guess. They're not going to be quantitatively accurate. They're, they're qualitative represent, representations of what's going on. I, remember, I think in the, uh, in the comments, Piazza, some people were saying D. Some people were disagreeing. Who wants to have a go at explaining what's going on here? Sure. Go on, then. So the, the observation the gentleman made was that if they are at rest, then um, they're in this arrangement, they are stratified. And if they're stratified, then there must be a difference in density. In fact, we know that liquid B, the density of liquid B, compared to the density of liquid A, is less. Is less. Yeah. The, the lighter liquid is on top, and the heavier liquid is on or uh, well, the less dense liquid is un underneath. If we know that, and we remember this formula that we introduced last week, the, then there's only um, one possible scenario which, which fits that description. Anyone want to? Yes. Yeah, how come? And so what about the slopes? No, steeper is right. It's, it's, um, it's confusing because we're going down, right? So um, the gradient dz, dp dz has to increase um, as the, or, or, or get more negative as, as you go deeper. And if the density of 
of, of A is more than density of B, then that slope is going to change and, and increase more quickly. So if, if you're getting confused between the pluses and minuses and the direction of the gradient, just um, think practically. If there's a heavier fluid, then incremental distances as you go down will, will result in a larger pressure, a larger force per unit area. You can't have a discontinuity, um, so it can't be A. And if it was C, that would mean that there was a, a more dense fluid on top than a light fluid, which wouldn't be at rest. And if it was D, then they would have the same densities. We don't know how different the densities of the two liquids are. They could be very, very similar. So in practice, it could look something like D, but it's going to have at some point a difference that is representative of B. Okay, good. And then for question two, has anybody already calculated what they should be? Yep, I give it someone else a chance. If there's any other takers, yes, at the back. Sorry, say that again. 100,000 100, sounds. Sorry, I can't hear the gentleman at the back. 101,000. Okay, thank you. So, 101,000 is remarkable because that is our definition of one bar of pressure. And that is what we, what we have at the top. So, 101,000, just slightly upwards, is our recognized standard atmosphere of pressure. And if we're saying, what is the pressure variation from top to bottom? And we're saying that we start with P1 then we know that our atmospheric pressure, our pressure at the bottom must be greater than our atmospheric pressure. So it must have this double negative, so because it has to increase. And the difference is purely the different densities of the fluids. And I'll put them out there just uh, to give you a chance to go look through them um, while I talk through them. So the, the pressure at the bottom is equal to the atmospheric pressure, basically, Minus times minus, so plus the density times the gravity times the height difference. <clears throat> First thing you have to be clear of is the units. We, we're using meters here, so that's okay. And then we have the difference between the two tanks is air and water. And so, yeah, the answer given, 101,000, is essentially, um, well, is essentially a, a good approximation for the second one with, with air because there's very little change in pressure throughout the tank. Some, some comments on Piazza were, it's going to be constant. That's also fine. Um, uh, we said that last week that pressure variation in a, in a gas is essentially negligible. And here we, we're kind of proving it. The pressure variation, um, the pressure gain is 120 pascals, right? Compared to, you know, almost a factor of two, 100,000 pascals through water. So it's, it's a reasonable assumption from an engineering point of view to say that this is, this is a, a negligible, negligible change in pressure and it's still around one, out, one standard atmosphere. This one, on the other hand, is around two. Everyone all right with that? So this is something that, uh, just refreshing what we were looking at last week. Okay, good. Yeah? Why do you say that we assume that it's a liquid? We use the liquid um, P2 minus P1 is equal to whatever equation. Okay. In gas, we're supposed to have the density as a function of the pressure and temperature. The pressure and temperature are both functions of the cells. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. The, strictly speaking, the um, density is a function of, of temperature, like we saw at the end of the lecture four slides. Um, I guess 
what we're not saying in this question, which we, are, I guess, have to assume if it's not stated, is that it's at constant temperature and that the height difference is negligible in terms of, a, of um, changing the uh, gravity. So the, um, unless, unless I think you're acting over very large distances, which would, uh, which would be essentially an atmosphere, or you're told that how the density is varying, you can assume that it's constant. But otherwise, it's a good point to query that. OK? Good stuff. Right, so today we look at different ways to measure pressure using a range of different, sometimes, um, um, di different objects that you may or may not have come across over, over the course of your experiences at, at home or in an engineering world. Um, and we go through a few examples as well. But the one that we're going to focus quite a lot on by the end of this, and I've already pointed out in your tutorial and in the coursework, is going to be manometry. Because this is a, you know, a classic engineering tool which is used in, in experimental aerodynamics um, to, to measure pressure variation over a surface under test. But the first one, and perhaps the most simple, is a piezometer, which is a relatively simple device which allows you to measure the pressure at a given point um, in, a, in, a, in a confined flow by just tapping into it and having a, um, a vertical pipe exposed to atmospheric pressure that the, the fluid can travel up or down, right? So you generally have quite a long pipe because if there is a high pressure in the pipe, then the fluid can come all the way out. Um, and the height that the, the, that the fluid is able to travel vertically, so against the force of gravity, is, as you can probably kind of intuitively feel, is proportional to the, to the pressure that the fluid must have inside the pipe before you expose it to atmospheric pressure. And there's lots of everyday examples of this uh, that we can, we can imagine just with our kind of inherent understanding of how fluids work. But it's interesting to apply what we've been learning to, in terms of the equations to this process. And again, what we're saying here, we're going, this time we're going from one to two, so we're going vertically upwards. So our, our negatives are, are you know, we, we're going in a positive direction this time, so Z2 minus Z1 is going to be positive. And this time, PA, our atmospheric pressure, is at point two. And what we can do for the purpose of um, simplicity is, is change the vector z into a scalar h height and say that we now have just the pressure at P1 is going to be this amount more than atmospheric pressure. And that's, that amount is purely the difference of um, the, the, the height of, that it travels up the exposed vertical pipe times the density times the gravity. And that allows us to get a direct and kind of and, and actually a visual representation of the pressure that it's traveling. You have to be careful not to make the hole too big, um, and you have to be careful to make sure that the, pipe, the vertical section of the pipe is long enough, but it works very well. And here's a kind of more practical example of how this is, can be used, something that will prompt a bit of discussion. OK, so you've got a, a big pipe going horizontal, and you're tapped into it in two locations, A and B, and there's a purely practical question. What is the, the difference in height telling us? Yeah. Yeah, it is, but can you explain in more kind of um, physical terms how we know that that's where the flow's going? So you're right that flow generally flows from high pressure to low pressure, but why? Think of what a pressure represents. The velocity is increasing. The, yep, the is increasing. But, so imagine that we're going to, I can't draw it, but imagine I'm drawing a box that, around this that captures both the, the flow at A and the flow at B. And we've got a high pressure at A and a lower pressure at B. And a pressure is a force per unit area. So it's a big force going that way. And there's another force going that way, but it's less, right? So what's the resultant force going that way? So it's in the, the re when you have a, a pressure gradient from high to low, what basically we're saying is that the resultant force 
is also going in that direction. And if the resultant force is going in that direction, Newton's second law, F equals MA, means there's a motion going in that direction as well. Okay. So, why is there a lot? Why is there a decrease in the pressure from A to B? Yeah? Yeah, excellent, yeah. yeah. And what, it, what anyone, or what do you think it might be? No. Or anyone else? Sorry. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, the friction. Um, did you want to add something? <laughs> no, yeah, you got there, yeah. So the, the, the friction force, um, the viscous friction that we met in a couple of weeks ago, which is due to the pressure gradient times the viscosity at the wall, is basically a, a friction force which, which pulls the flow back to be zero at the wall and creates that parabolic uh, profile. And it's because of that force that there's a loss. And in, in hydrodynamics, or, or we, we often talk about pressure loss in pipes, right? So if you have a very long pipe, you need quite a lot of energy to get your fluid along it because there's this kind of constant uh, viscous force pulling it back as you go through it. So, you know, in, in oil and gas and in very long pipeline uh, design, you look at how, you, you talk about what is the pressure loss of this system. If, the, if, the, if there are pipe networks go over hundreds of kilometers, then there's going to be substantial pressure losses that need to be overcome if you want to get your fluid from A to B. And you're going to talk a bit about, more about that in the second part of the course, but it's worth highlighting it now. So, yeah, how do we... How do we calculate that pressure loss? Well, it's a simple two-step um, process using what we've learned on the previous slide about our piezometer. You have the pressure at A and the pressure at B, which are purely related to their height, and you combine them. One minus the other, and you just have the height difference. H A minus H B times by rho times G. And what's rho times G? Anyone remember? Yep. Specific weight, exactly. Gamma. And we, 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 um, we use this uh, to just to simplify slightly the analysis. Okay, cool. Any comments, thoughts, questions? No? Nope, good. So we move on to the next one. And this is one where there's a little bit more discussion on, on Piazza as well. Um, so this one is a barometer. And, you know, indeed some houses... You might have lived and have, have, um, may have had a barometer on the wall, and it's a way to measure quite sensitive uh, changes in pressure. Um, and they're usually hinged at the center point so that they can be rotated, right? So you can see sometimes people rotating the barometer in their houses for one reason or another, and we're going to th think about that in the next slide. They tend to be full of mercury instead of water. Again, there's a reason for that we'll get to. And the top bit tends to be a vacuum. So other than that, it's very, very similar to a piezometer. And we can apply the same analysis, again, from 1 to 2. Um, and it's going vertically upwards. But we're going to assume that, although it probably isn't a perfect vacuum, it's, it's the, the point at 2 is, 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 a, is a near vacuum. So the pressure is 0 there. And so the pressure, um, we turn this around and we say, OK, what is the pressure at 1? The pressure at 1 is effectively atmospheric pressure because it's, it's a continuous fluid which is at the same height um, as where the, where the reservoir meets the vertical tube. And it's, um, the atmospheric pressure must be somehow proportional to the height that the mercury climbs through the vertical pipe times the density of mercury and gravity. So it's, it's, it's pushing against the vacuum. So that vertical height displacement is a, is, is a way to directly measure the atmospheric pressure. Okay, but some questions arise. And these are um, copied onto uh, Piazza. So, you know, please feel free to continue the discussion there. I'm, I can't see what's been written, but um, happy to hear your thoughts. So question one, why would, what would be the benefit of using mercury instead of water? Yeah. Yeah, 
exactly, yeah. Mercury is more dense, so it takes a greater force, or a greater force per unit area, or pressure, to push it um, a small amount up the tube. Right, so, again, you have to know a little bit about what is the pressure that you're measuring, but if you, if presumably, um, there's been calculations that have been made by the barometer designers, and they've realized that by having a measuring fluid which is more dense, you can compact the barometer so that it's able to represent changes in a smaller space. Okay, good. What about question two? What happens if you increase the cross-sectional area of the, of the tube? I had a similar question well, before. So, there are some caveats to the ideal answer, but the ideal answer is that the size, the, the volume of the, the tube shouldn't have a difference, right? So, the, the hydrostatics just, just consider the vertical height difference. And in theory, in a perfect world, in an ideal situation, the height, rise, the height rise of mercury would be the same whether it was very narrow or very large, but in, in practice, you're right that there are effects such as um, uh, the meniscus formation on, on, the, on, the, on the sides of the tube, the fact that there is only a finite amount of mercury in the reservoir um, that would, would change that. But the theoretical answer is that it shouldn't affect the height rise. Okay, what about three? What happens if you incline it? You know, you see people fiddling with their barometer slightly at an angle. Why would you do that? Yeah, how come? You're right. Yeah, no, sure, no problem. Um, so, for a given change in pressure, there's a given vertical rise, and it's always going to be the same in, in theory, regardless of the shot size or shape of the container. If you incline your barometer, then the mercury has to travel a longer distance to achieve the same vertical rise. And therefore, if you have radiations of measurement on the, on the barometer itself, you have an um, ability to, to measure in more accuracy because it's traveling a greater distance for the same pressure. So we, we use an inclination on a barometer to, make it, uh, to, to allow for a more sensitive reading. And what happens if you reduce the angle? I guess that's the same question. Um, you, if you increase the angle, then it will go further for the same pressure. If you reduce it, then it will revert to closer to being vertical, and it will you know, essentially uh, travel a, a shorter distance along the glass tube for the same pressure. OK. Yeah? Yeah, good question. I mean, yeah, right. So if, if, if the, depending on the dimensions, it could be, you could consider it like a, a cylindrical container where the height would be changing with the cross, the cross section would be changing. Um, but I mean, in practice, it wouldn't work, basically. Any other thoughts? Yeah? So the benefit is that you can perceive um, in, you will see a larger change on that scale for the same pressure rise. So if you like, you can, you can calibrate your barometer to be more, to, to give you a more sensitive reading. Yeah, okay. Okay, and this is a a very similar concept, um, an inclined manometer, but it's just um, spelt out in a bit more detail to help you see the, the um, you know, some of the analysis involved. So in this case, we have a tank um, with a cross-section area A, big A, in, so it's a circular tank with cross-section area big A, inclined pipe, cross-section area small A, at an angle of alpha, lots of A's, um, and that should be plane. So 
when the fluid is drawn up the inclined pipe, the, the, by whatever this is connected to, this, is, this isn't open to atmosphere, this is connected to something, when um, the fluid level in the tank drops by an equivalent amount. So this is an example where we've got to conserve the volume of the fluid, and we can use that to find, again, the uh, pressure change between points two and points one. I guess the key here in this situation is, again, uh, to consider that a rise in the inclined arm is associated by a fall in the reservoir. So it's just looking at that scenario in a little bit more depth, a bit more detail. So the height change is combined of H2 and delta H. So H2 plus delta H is the total height change, which must be, again, proportional to the total pressure change. This is a really nice example of how it doesn't matter the size or the shape of the apparatus that you're using, it's just the vertical change that is relevant. But then, in order to, to kind of calculate this, we need to relate these, um, these quantities to geometric properties. So we have our delta H times A, so our cross-sectional area, our volume of the fall, A, times delta H, will give us that cylindrical volume of the fall of fluid there, will be pretty approximately equal to um, H2, sorry, D sine of uh, alpha, which is our vertical distance, times by the cross-sectional area A. As you can see, the level of the fluid is, is not perpendicular to the walls, so it's, it's an approximation, but it's a, it's a good one. And so, once we have our two geometric laws, then we can show that the, the, difference, that the, the difference in the two pressures is equal to the sum of these two height changes times the density and the gravity. Like this. Okay, so that, that's, um, that's a little bit more involved, but that's a good example. That thing that came from an exam a couple of years ago. So I think, you know, um, hopefully you're on your way to, to understanding a question like that. Um, and it should give you confidence that, you know, already what we're, what we're um, looking at is the type of thing that you could be asked to do um, in an exam. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, good. So, it's, you know, some of you might be getting, you know, you might be really getting the idea now, and you might think, okay, yeah, I get it, this is, it's the rate of change, it's the change of height is equal to uh, the rate of change of, um, which, uh, of pressure in a vertical direction, and that can be calculated by looking at, um, you know, the, it's proportional to the density and the gravity times by the height difference. And we've seen that again and again. And there's the, like I've said, we've basically looked now at piezometer, barometer, inclined manometer, and they're all pretty much the same thing. And the last one we're going to look at, which is going to be for the rest of today, is going to be the manometer, which is used, like I said, quite extensively in aerodynamics to measure not just um, so, to measure the pressure, but also um, you can do that with several manometers to get a real feel for how the pressure is varying on a surface. So, a U-tube manometer bank is when you have lots of tubes connected to different points on a surface, which you're then going to expose to a, to a fluid flow or an airflow. And if you get a chance to see our wind tunnels in George Beg. You'll be able to see um, these in action. You'll see banks of tubes, very similar to this, um, connected with rubber tubes carefully to um, what are essentially small pressure tappings, so small holes drilled into the surface of the aerodynamic shape that you're measuring. And then you are attaching the other end of the tube to the underside of that hole so that when the air goes through it, you'll be able to measure the pressure at that point. And as the airflow goes through, you can see a change. And I've, this one was from um, a manual, I think, of, of how to set up your pressure bank. This one I adapted, make into some kind of an animation to help you see what's going on. So you start off, you've got uh, your manometer, which is basically like a, an extended upside down umbrella handle, and you start off with some fluid in the bottom, with both the top and this side exposed to the atmosphere. So the two fluid levels are the same. So they're both exposed to atmospheric pressure, so they're not going to change in height. 
but as soon as you apply a, um, a fluid uh, velocity through the geometry, these pressure heights will change according to the local pressure at this point. So, and the idea is that according to how the pressure is at that particular point, that will exert a different uh, force per unit area on the top of the manometer, and that will lead to a different uh, behavior of the fluid inside the manometer. And it's always proportional to that height change. It's not the deviation from the original position, it's the height change between the open and the um, tested <laughs> section. So what's going on in that particular case? You've got this narrowing and then widening of the duct. So what's, going, what's happening at the narrowest point? Yeah? The pressure is extremely high. Extremely high or extremely low? Extremely low. So yeah, it's the other way around. So that the height is extremely high, and that's because the, the pressure reaches a minimum at, at, the, at the throat. And the, the minimum, the, as, the, as the pressure reaches a minimum at the throat, it sucks the, the liquid in the manometer up a greater distance. Okay, that's one question. Can we explain why? why what does that mean for the fluid, yeah? Yeah, excellent. So one, one, one explanation is Bernoulli's equation, and this is something that we're going to look at a lot in the, in the weeks to come. Bernoulli's equation in a nutshell, says that along a streamline, the static pressure uh, and the dynamic pressure and hydrostatic pressure are, remain constant. What it means for this example is that if the pressure goes down, something has to go up to compensate. What goes up? The velocity, the dynamic pressure. So while the pressure will be lowest here, the velocity will be highest. So it's accelerating to the point where it reaches the apex of the throat, and then it starts to slow down again as the throat diverges. And that's the, if you like, the, the beauty of using a manometer bank is you can see very graphically the flow variation using uh, a range of, of, um, of, of, of manometers. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you can. Absolutely. Third, third Mechanics has uh, a range of tools available, um, and the, con the continuity equation is a good one. So what, what does the continuity equation tell us here? Yeah, absolutely. And if we, if we define our amount of mass as maybe what we're going to look at, I think, week after next, an element of fluid which is moving with a unit of velocity in a, in a, in a, in a unit of time, then our, our, the mass flow, so that the amount of fluid that we have moving through a location per second, it has to be the same at every point through that, through that uh, nozzle. Um, that's the conservation of mass. There's nowhere else for it to go. You could argue it could go down the manometer. I mean, it's not going to because it goes in, um, you know, that would, that would have to change direction quite rad radically and the holes are very small. So the only place that it can go is out at the exit. And so if the cross-section is changing, something has to compensate. And in this case, the mass flow rate is equal to the density times the area times the velocity. If the area goes down, the velocity has to go up. So that's, that's going ahead a, a, um, a couple of lectures. But if you're interested, you can see this in chapter, I think, three of the book. And um, we'll, we'll be there soon enough. It's good to be aware of it. Any other thoughts, comments? Yep. So that's a good question. Um, all the ones that we're going to look at now look at the measure of change in height, but there are electric, electronic measurements that look at how um, properties of the air change at a given point by studying their conductivity. There are uh, chemical measurements that look at um, that, so you can change the, the color of a paint according to the force that it's exerting on that, on, on, on that, um, on that surface. 
So there are other ways to measure pressure, but they're beyond, if you like, the scope of what we're looking at now. So all of the pressure measurement techniques that we're looking at now involve just the, the change of a, of a fluid in the vertical height direction. Okay. So, and it should be then fairly obvious how do we do this for a manometer. Um, but we'll, we'll step through the process just to point out a few pitfalls and a, and a few techniques so that you're familiar with it for your coursework and for your tutorial for next week. So you always start from a known pressure. In this example, we're measuring the pressure between 0.1 and 0.4. 0.1 is open to the atmosphere, and although we haven't drawn it here, we're assuming that 0.4 isn't. So we apply this formula that says the pressure change is equal to the height that it travels through. And you apply common sense that if it goes down, then it must gain in pressure. So if it goes from 1 to 2, it must increase downwards. And then, perhaps less obviously, if we are going uh, from why do, we, why do we measure the height to 0.2? is because that is the, the height of the free surface. And that means that if we know the pressure variation from point 0.1 to point 0.2, we also know the pressure at 3, because it's on the same horizontal plane in a continuously connected reservoir of fluid of constant density at rest. And that's one of our laws of our hydro hydrostatics. And so this, with this one equation, we can get from point 0.1 to point 0.3. Now, if the question is, what's the pressure difference between 0.1 and 0.4, or atmospheric and 0.4, and we know that this is a liquid and this is air, pretty much you could stop there, right? Because that is the, that is, um, the, 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 there is going to be a reduction in pressure as you move vertically upwards through the air, but it's going to be very small. because the pressure variation in gases is negligible compared to variation in liquid. And we, 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 get, we, we illustrate this with an example here. Okay, so we've now said that this, this particular gra uh, liquid has a specific gravity. Anyone remind us what a specific gravity is? Yep. Specific gravity is the ratio between the density of a fluid and the density of a reference fluid. Excellent. And, and if we're not told what the reference fluid is, we assume it's <coughs> water. Perfect. And we're told the, the physical dimensions of the manometer as well. So we apply our now very familiar expression between 1 and 2. It's always good practice to define a datum, a reference point for your coordinate system, and always remember that Z is vertically upwards. No matter what's going on, stick to that and you'll be, you'll be safe. So our first pressure rise from atmospheric to 2, we can calculate that by looking at water times specific gravity of that fluid, so 0.85 times 1,000 times G. And in this case, we're told the atmospheric pressure is 96,000 pascals, so it's slightly below atmospheric international standard atmosphere value, but it doesn't matter. We, we take that for granted. Oh, a little bit off, off the right location, but that's... That's the pressure that we're calculating for pressure two. Pressure three is the same, right? So once you have pressure two, you know that if you're not moving in a vertical direction, we can say that pressure three is the same. It's at the same vertical height, so pressure three and pressure two must be identical. And what we didn't do in the last slide, but we, we alluded to it, is that if you then increase from pressure 3 to pressure 4, there's going to be a reduction in pressure, but it's going to be minimal, because you're going through air. So here, your pressure is going to be slightly lower, and you're going to have now um, a reduction by 1.225 times 9.81 times 0.8, which is the vertical height H2. And you can see that the reduction is a mere, it's not, not even 10 pascals from the pressure that you had gained by going from 1 to 2. So 
you can see that you know, the, redu the, redu the, the pressure change through the, the height of air, which is represented by the green here, is really quite small compared to the pressure change through the liquid. And this is even you know, a lower density than water. It's 0.85 of water, but it's still you know, a factor of 10,000 um, difference. Okay? So if you're talking about the kind of dimensions that you're likely to have in a wind tunnel, or you're likely to have in a practical me measuring environment, then it's absolutely fine to neglect the variation of a pressure in a, in a gas compared to that of a liquid. You can always convince yourself by doing the extra calculation and putting the two numbers together, but generally you won't need to as an engineer. Okay? Any comments on what we just did there? No? All good? Okay. Oh, yeah. P4 is equal to P3. Does it say that? Oh, oh, yeah, you can essentially say that, yeah. So do you mean this here? Yeah, yeah, because the, 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 if you have either the pressure at P3 or you calculate the pressure difference from P3 to P4, it's very similar. It's only 0.1% difference. That's a good question. I would always give. I would always aim for some a greater precision when you calculate for something like that. So, aim for a couple of decimal places to keep your answer accurate, and then by the end of it, you can give. You can also give your answer to uh, fewer significant figures if you want to. It's difficult to give a rule of thumb, but I would say at least three. At least three significant figures. But, but if you're in doubt, just, just give more. The, in, the, the important thing is to, in your working out, be consistent. If you change the number of decimal places and uh, significant figures in your working out, it can, get, it can deteriorate the accuracy. Okay, so we're nearly there for today. The last thing I wanted to point out is a worked example which is a little bit more involved, and the solution is already given. So I'd like you to have a look at this, and uh, feel free to raise any questions that you might have in the forum. In this example, we are moving through three different fluids. So we're moving through water, then air, and mercury, okay? and then back through water again. So it's, it's a more involved analysis, but it's exactly the same principles. And it, if you can follow that, then you, you'll be pretty much okay on any manometry question. Okay. That's it. I might see some of you tomorrow. Otherwise, I'll see the rest of you Thursday. Thanks. Ah, oh, ah. Oh. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, there's, there's something to mention before we go. The, Thank you. Sorry, sorry for keeping you for a, a couple of 30 seconds more. So I wanted to say something about Piazza. Piazza, I think the vast majority are using that really well. I think there is, um, there's, there's a lot of cases where you're helping each other. There's a facility for you to answer your peers' questions, and that's great. But in one instance, sorry, can I just have your attention? 30 seconds. We, we did see an instance where there was some inappropriate comments made, maybe not being very polite to peers, um, saying, oh, maybe, you know, you should try harder to answer this question or whatever. Not, not a very helpful comment. Please don't do that. Please use this appropriate, like the vast majority of you are doing. We, we can see who are making comments, um, and we don't want to, but we would... If we, if we were forced to, we would have to bar people from using the forum, okay? So please keep it a, a useful place and a helpful place, and it should be good. Thank you very much.
a good question. Um, so the short answer is that it's, it's quite rare. But in cases, there, there might be practical reasons why you have to isolate the use of maybe you need um, um, quite a high density fluid to, to make your um, luminometer sensitive and you don't want it to be near to the apparatus for safety reasons, right? So you would maybe put liquid water, you know, um, in the exposed area where the flow goes through it and then you would have somewhere else um, connected through air to mercury in an enclosed area for safety. But it's not that common. We don't use it. Thank you. It's a good question. A good yeah, you question, too. Sir. Um, yeah, tell me. So, I saw that the process had a due date of like 17th of, of December. Mm -hmm. So, like, are we not supposed to do them like weekly? Or? So, you're recommended to do them weekly, mm -hmm. but you don't have to finish them until the 17th of oh, December. Okay. You can do them as many times as you like. So, okay. you can repeat them uh, many times as you like and mm -hmm. always store the highest answer. Alright, thanks. No worries. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I have a question about uh, the hot gases. Yeah, tell me. Okay. Let's, let's okay. move over there so that. Oh, let's actually go on, carry on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can, can we treat. Gases, uh, just like kinetic theory of gases, where if you're in a closed volume, it's the same pressure. Or is that not valid anymore? Um, yeah, you can actually. Um, so the gas, if it's if it's at rest as well, mm -hmm. then you can assume that the pressure through that gas in the enclosed space is at constant pressure. But once it's open, we have to apply the. Once it's open, then you have to, in this Use analysis, the yeah, you have to assume that it's reached the equilibrium. I see. Okay, thank you. No worries. Yes, uh, <coughs> small question. Uh, as the condensed load, uh, what we need just for, for example, for one of the assumption of the test for the test and everything, are the condensed loads enough or should they go with the buffer? I think, I think the answer is yes, they should be. Um, but they're, they're not going to necessarily always explain you everything. But if you see something really complicated in the book mm -hmm. that isn't in the condensed notes, yeah. then it's very likely that you wouldn't you know, need to know all that mm -hmm. analysis. Mm -hmm. for okay. If you have any questions about something specific, just ask. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I just have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, do you have a course book next week? Yeah, so the course book will be issued mid to late week next week, either the Wednesday or the so Thursday. Is it a, a tutorial exam? It's not an exam, it's, you, it's an open book test, so you get two weeks to answer it and then submit is it online. online? If there might be some questions that Zutan can help with as well, so. They gave us this equation, mm -hmm. and we were supposed to get the derivative, mm -hmm. so, so we just distributed, mm -hmm. and then we got uh, this one. So how did we get this? From so, so we multiply it out, yeah. so h is a constant. Right. The only thing that's variable here is um, light. So you have to do, so this comes out. that goes to zero, yeah. you, you do differential of that, and this goes to 2y, um, and so then the two cancels out, and you have 3um y over h squared, 3um y over h squared. So, just it's so the differential of y squared is 2y. So you, you you replace y squared by two y and then the two cancels. How, how is it two y for y squared? Isn't is it, uh, isn't it uh, normal uh, differentiation? Yeah. So if you what so we're asking, do you have a pen? Three y cubed. Yeah. Can I can I draw on here? Yeah, of course. Okay. So well, I, I'll you. just do it here, right? So d u by dy of of this, so that one's already zero, yes. so we won't worry about that one. But this one, so three u m y squared over two h squared minus. Okay, so the y squared, so you, that the y squared goes to two y, and then it's everything is still times by.